Welcome everybody to this GMF German Marshall Fund debate on Turkey turns the tide in the Libyan civil war. Actually, I'm going to, my name is Christina Kausch. I'm uh, with the German Marshall Fund in Brussels. And um, um, actually I'm gonna, you know, uh, question the very premise of our, of our own title <laughs> to start with, uh, whether, because whether or not Turkey has actually turned the tide of the Libyan civil war for good through its recent intervention, forceful intervention in, in favor of the GNA um, remains to be seen. And this is one of the questions that I guess uh, we're going to address uh, in the next hour and a half. And um, I'm very happy to have very, two very competent speakers here. So um, Ricardo Fabiani is the head of the uh, Middle East and North Africa program at the International Crisis Group. Thank you for being here, Ricardo. And Zeha Kubinc is a professor for international relations at Cardiff House University. Thank you to you also, Zehan. So perhaps, um, Ricardo, maybe I can start off with you. Um, maybe you can give us just a few minutes of like a sort of big picture overview. Where is, what's the point we are at right now? What is the state of play? And perhaps also a few pointers, uh, what are the factors uh, that will determine how things will develop in the next, in the next few weeks and months? Please. Yeah, sure. Happy to do this. Uh, just um, as, a, as a clarification, I'm only the director for North Africa at Crisis Group. I'm not the head of the whole Middle East and North Africa department. Uh, well, having said that, uh, where we are right now, I think uh, in the past uh, week or so, we have basically seen the most important uh, and dramatic military development in the Libyan conflict of the past few months, the fall of the al Wutia uh, air base, uh, that had been previously in the hands of Haftar's uh, troops, Haftar's, let's say, coalition since 2014. But most importantly, uh, this is a strategic asset uh, from which, uh, in theory, it is even possible to reach uh, Tunisia uh, and Algeria. And as you can understand, this is a pretty important air base from a tactical and military point of view. Now it's controlled by the militias, uh, and the armed groups affiliated with the government of national accord uh, in Tripoli and supported by uh, uh, the, the Turkish uh, military. The fall of this air base has triggered a series of uh, consequences in the short term. Uh, first of all, Haftar has been forced to withdraw, or at least his forces, uh, the forces affiliated with this coalition, have been forced to withdraw from the outskirts of Tripoli. Uh, Russian mercenaries have been seen redeploying away from the front line in the, on the outskirts uh, of Tripoli, which had been the focus of the offensive since April 2019. So in, in, a short, in a few words, I would say that the momentum has dramatically shifted, at least on the ground, at least in the short term. And now after, for the first time since April 2019, is effectively on the defensive. After several months of what could have been defined, as a very slow, gradual, but almost inevitable uh, advance. Obviously, on the other side, the pro-Tripoli uh, militias feel emboldened, and you, know, you can hear already calls for uh, the offensive to continue east uh, with the idea of basically liberating even eastern Libya from uh, uh, the, the grip of the Haftar. Now, what happens next is obviously uh, the key question here, and let me be very clear what happens next, nobody really knows it. There are many oversimplifications already circulating. I would say there are two main interpretations that are dominating the, the conversation on Libya. One is the expectation that there will be an escalation. And the other one is the idea that uh, there will be some sort of Turkish-Russian grand bargain or partition even of Libya. I think both ideas are a bit simplistic. What is true and what we know with a certain degree of uh, certainty is that Russia has already been sending around uh, to Tripoli around 15, sorry, to Libya around 15, 20 fighter jets that are currently in Jufra and in Tobruk, which has obviously sparked rumors that they're ready to double down their investment on Haftar and they want to help them retake the airbase. However, as I've mentioned before, there's already been uh, reports that Wagner mercenaries, so Russian mercenaries, are repositioning away from the front line. While at the same time, the rhetoric coming from the US is already adjusting to this new status quo, with the US effectively 
extending a sort of branch to the Tripoli government. And even the rhetoric coming from the UAE, one of the key backers, one of the key supporters of Haftar, is also shifting. And at the same time, we've also here heard, we've also seen that uh, Turk, the Turks and the Russians have been have called for a ceasefire, which obviously it's not necessarily a, a breakthrough in itself, but it's interesting because it shows that there might be something happening behind, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and obviously the big question now is, what is Russia trying to achieve while calling for a ceasefire at the same time uh, reinforcing Haftar's air force? Some people are claiming that Russia is actually trying to beef up uh, Haftar's line of defense. What they want to avoid is basically the GNA, the pro Tripoli militias to overrun Haftar's defense line and to take over effectively the south and the east of Libya. And even if we assume that this is the case, again, what happens next, it's, it's unclear. So the impression here, I would say, to simplify a little bit all this information, is that Turkey and Russia have something in common in this scenario post the fall of al Wutia, which is a desire to reap the benefits of their limited investment in Libya, one side Haftar on the other side, obviously, the Tripoli government. They have an interest, a shared interest in sidelining the Europeans and the US, and they have a joint interest in becoming the key players in this conflict. The US seem happy to support the status quo in which the Russians are now hegemonic are not hegemonic, so they have to share, if you want, their hegemony with Turkey. France and Italy don't have enough resources, don't seem to have enough resources and political capital to intervene. But then there are other main wild cards, which is what are the other Arab states going to do? Are Egypt and the UAE going to accept a potential and a, a, a hypothetical condominium between Turkey and Russia? Is Algeria going to step in? on the side of the Tripoli government, as the rumors seem to indicate with this idea of a possible military pact between Tripoli uh, and Algiers. I would say that, just to cap it, this, this very short introduction, that escalation and partition or some sort of condominium are both realistic options at the moment. The, uh, I would say the evidence seemed to point towards some possible understanding between these two countries, between Turkey and Russia, but there are many unknown quantities, wild cards that still need to be taken in consideration, and namely, as I said, are the UAE, Egypt, and Algeria. And until we know their position, it will not be at least clear what will happen in the next months. And let me stop here, because this is just meant to be a very short introduction of our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Regal, uh, for being so succinct. Um, one, I have one follow-up question, but first I forgot to mention, um, for our audience, um, in the Q&A function that you see below, you can ask questions on a running basis. So we first off, we're first going to have a little bit of a conversation here uh, with the panelists, and then we'll open up to the questions. So uh, please uh, write your questions in the Q&A. Um, Ricardo, just one question on, on what you've just said. So um, uh, you mentioned these two options, right? So either there's an escalation of basically there's going to be a, what many have uh, you know, compared to as a repetition of the Astana process of the Astana uh, deal in Syria, right? So um, that there's going to be some sort of deal between Russia and uh, and Turkey that, by means of probably a sort of informal partition, they would basically divide the country into spheres of influence. Um, and the great unknown unknown is how everybody else will react to that. No, and in order to know that. Uh, we of course we need the you know the, the the military information and when we are but we also need to know what everybody wants and I hope that Sehad is going now going to give us uh, to enlighten us on what 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 Turkey's motivation is. Before how likely I'd like to ask you, Ricardo, how likely do you think is a is a petition this kind of spheres of influence um, the spheres of influence scenario? Because I wonder what the advantage to Russia would be to have an escalation, be given that. Well, at least what I've read about from by military analysts, it's pretty clear that Haftar can, at this point, no longer um, um, aspire to take Tripoli, right? So if there's no, oh no, um, if, there's, if, 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 if the option of winning over the whole country is off the table, what would be the interest of any of the factions to further escalate if it's a lost cause? Uh, indeed, that's a key question, and the Russians have all 
always been very clear that their confidence in Haftarts being able to take over the whole of the country was always quite limited, even months ago when other countries were actually hoping that that could happen. Uh, the problem obviously here is that uh, Russia is only one of the actors backing Haftar. And, you know, it could be argued that uh, Egypt and the UAE are at least equally uh, decisive, equally important in Haftar's military uh, tactics or military de decisions. So there could be a scenario where Russia, for example, is uh, pulling in a direction while the Emiratis and the Egyptians, for example, undermine uh, the same efforts. We've seen this, for example, after the Moscow summit, uh, where that was supposed to usher in a new ceasefire uh, in Libya, and uh, yet that failed because arguably the Emiratis were not particularly keen at that time uh, to reach a ceasefire. So I would say the Russians here are a, a very important actor uh, as, as the Turks, but probably their investment in terms of hard power is not as decisive you know, it's not at that level of decisiveness that could actually single-handedly tip the balance in favor of an option or another. Thank you. Zerhat, um, perhaps uh, you can tell us a little bit about, about the Turkish piece of this. So um, what are Turkey's motivations for this? Obviously, um, how likely is it that Turkey is going to be willing and able to sustain this effort in the longer run, also given that, yeah, given its financial constraints, given public opinion constraints at home, and of course the whole Eastern Med uh, gas resources piece that plays in. Um, floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to thank GMF uh, for having me for the third time in a year uh, to discuss the same topic. Uh, I was in Brussels uh, two months ago, I think, just before the, the pandemic, uh, to discuss the Libya issue with one of your colleagues from the International Crisis Group. Uh, it was a very rewarding experience, but I remember my first time to discuss the broader issue of Eastern Mediterranean, and that event had uh, even more... Uh, contentious title, I would say. It was all quiet in the Eastern Mediterranean. Of course, it was not quiet at the time, and Libya was not in such sharp focus. But in that meeting, I remember that uh, I identified Turkey, Turkey's assertiveness in the Eastern Mediterranean, as a practice of a lone wolf. You know, Turkey was on its own at the time, you know. It had no potential partners or allies to work with, especially it felt cornered or uh, uh, encircled by uh, not so friendly, some of them hostile powers uh, who seemed to, who seemed, who seemed determined to uh, uh, strike a deal on the partition or on the sharing of uh, uh, hydrocarbon resources in the Eastern Mediterranean at the expense of Turkey. Uh, as things stand today, uh, well, my conclusion is, let me uh, put this first, is even a lone wolf can occasionally score a string of successes. So the, uh, the case in point is Libya, of course, you know. Uh, initially, I had uh, doubts, suspicions uh, that Turkey could play a decisive role in the conflict, you know, in uh, turning the tables around in Libya. But uh, the persistence and assertiveness seem to pay off. And uh, uh, one reason for that is that, you know, uh, although Turkey is, is on its own, its policy is coherent and consistent. Whereas on the other side, you know, you have a gathering of actors supporting Haftar, but there is no coherence or consistency. And it seems, it seems a very loose coalition against anti-Turkish coalition, but uh, it is not, its foundations are not so solid. So that explains partly the current sac military success, uh, uh, the, the Libyan uh, government of national accord forces uh, scored against Haftar forces. Uh, as for the motivations, I mean, in the, in the previous meeting, my previous uh, meeting with GMF, I talked, uh, uh, I elaborated on those reasons, uh, but here I'm going to give you a summary. Well, there are historical uh, reasons, you know, the historical ties between Turkey 
and, uh, and, and Libya. You know, and even, you know, uh, the founder of the Republic's uh, involvement in the uh, guerrilla war, warfare against the Italians in Tripoli, you know, is offered to the public to uh, broaden the, uh, the support for what Turkey is up or what Turkey is doing in Libya. Therefore, uh, even uh, ideologically speaking, it may not be compatible with the current uh, political elites' uh, ideological inclinations. You know, even the heritage of Mustafa Kemal in Libya from time to time is offered as a justification for Turkey's involvement and interest in, in the affairs of Libya. Uh, the two countries have uh, uh, interesting and strong historical ties. Uh, there is the economic motivation, you know, uh, Libya has been an outlet for uh, Turkish contracting services for decades, indeed since 1974, after Turkish intervention in Cyprus uh, and in, the, in Western Europe when things, when economies began to crumble, you know, Libya emerged as an alternative outlet for Turkish, uh, exporting Turkish labor and also contracting services. And during the, at the time of Operation uh, Unified Protector uh, by, uh, by NATO, uh, you know, uh, Turkish contractors were about to secure or secured contracts, according to claims, amounting $16 billion. And I checked with my uh, sources who were doing business in Libya. It seems that they had those Turkish um, contractors had an, an outstanding balance so in the tune of one to two billion dollars. You know, uh, they were not paid uh, uh, such uh, amounts due to the, uh, the NATO operation and uh, the subsequent civil war in Libya. There is the ideological dimension, of course, because after the Arab Spring or after the, the Arab uh, revolts, uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood, obviously, uh, Libya remains the only success story, you know, uh, in terms of clinging to power. And in that regard, this success story obviously dovetails with uh, Turkey's President Erdogan's ideological affinity. So there is the ideological dimension. And, uh, and there is uh, the, the, the dimension related to the delimitation of maritime jurisdiction areas in the Eastern Mediterranean. You know, uh, uh, the proponents of the idea that Libya was Turkey's, uh, is Turkey's maritime neighbor, therefore Turkey should conclude a, an agreement with Libya to, uh, to delimit the exclusive economic zone uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, as a counterweight to the claims and deals concluded by other Eastern Mediterranean powers. You know, the idea was up in the air for some time, but last winter, uh, President Erdogan decided to throw its lot, what I call the hardliners in Turkey, as regards to the issue of Eastern Mediterranean. You know, uh, for, for some time, uh, the foreign ministry was advocating a moderate position, taking into account uh, Turkey's uh, relations with the EU, links with the EU, and relations with Greece, etc. Whereas Navy uh, was arguing or uh, championing a hardline position, and uh, they they were claiming that Turkey should adopt, had to adopt a more assertive position and go ahead and sign a deal with Libya, which was the only country, uh, which was the only potential partner for Turkey in as far as the issue of the limitation of exclusive economic zones uh, in, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean was concerned. Well, what is interesting is that Erdogan's ideological uh, motivations overlapped temporarily, I would say, the, the probably the, uh, the only surviving Kemalist institution in Turkey, that is Navy. Navy perceives the world through a prism of a pure Westphalian. Uh, Turkey, uh, sorry, the Navy perceives the world through a pure Westphalian prism. So the, the issue we're discussing in the context of Libya is a sovereignty issue or a derivative of sovereignty. Whereas uh, for Tayyip Erdogan, the issue has connotations beyond transcending uh, sovereignty. But in the particular context of Libya, their motivations perfectly overlap. 
And uh, this also uh, can be seen as another manifestation of this pragmatic coalition between the so-called Euro-Asianists in Turkey and uh, Tayyip Erdogan's political Islamism. Uh, therefore, for the moment, uh, there are uh, historical, ideological, legal, political, and military, as well as economic motivations for Turkey's involvement in Libya. Uh, I have to add uh, a, a, another dimension, which is uh, related to what is taking place in the Libyan battleground. I mean, what we witness in Libya is a textbook case of fourth generation of warfare, or new war, as Mary Caldor defined it decades ago, you know, or a hybrid war, indeed. I mean, you have a plethora of actors. You have uh, states, you have non-state uh, non actors, you have private security companies involved. So it is a textbook case of hybrid wa warfare. And it seems that Turkey has, uh, has been successfully implementing the lessons it learned through its involvement in the Syrian conflict. You know, in Syria, in the very beginning, you know, uh, the Turkish military or Turkish security apparatus was up against a situation which it was not familiar with, which it was not trained to tackle with. But obviously, they are successfully translating those lessons learned in the Syrian theater of operations to Libya. And, you know, uh, you know the public, uh, or in social media in Turkey, you know, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the success of Turkish UAVs, armed UAVs against the Russian, you know, much coveted Russian Pantsir system. So, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, a precursor to this development was what happened in, back in, uh, in winter in Syria. You know, the Turkish UAVs were able to take out several Russian air defense systems. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, and in that particular theater of operations, you know, the Turkish built weapons proved themselves. At least this is how they are publicized. And this may have a payoff for Turkey in the form of export uh, deals with third countries, which may be interested in buying uh, such weapon systems from uh, an untraditional supplier like Turkey. I think I will stop here. Uh, uh, one thing I, sh I would like to add, uh, Libya is far beyond the conventional military and naval capabilities of Turkey. So um, my uh, initial skepticism about the success of Turkish military involvement was related to this issue of distance. However, you know, uh, as a result of this probably disarray among the, the, uh, the opposition, the, oppo uh, uh, the forces on the other side, Turkey was able to overcome this uh, distance uh, issue and and with the tacit probably help and approval or consent of the United States. I've been studying use of um, uh, force in Turkish foreign policy for decades. And it is the first time the United States has not objected the Turkish employment of US built weapons in any theater of operations whatsoever. You know, Turkey has deployed three US built frigates of Tripoli. Turkey has deployed Hawk and air defense missile systems in that uh, field of operations. And Turkey, Turkish Air Force, two or three weeks ago, uh, uh, displayed a show of force uh, with the American built tanker aircraft, fight, fighter aircraft, and uh, airborne early warning aircraft. I haven't seen any object, I haven't heard any objection from, the, from uh, the United States, and that kind of surprises me. This doesn't fit the usual pattern as regards to Turkish uh, employment of U.S. weapons in conflict zones. I'll stop here. Actually, I won't let you stop here. So why do you think that is? Uh, you said there is a surprise. Uh, I I imply that uh, there is, the U.S. is tacitly approving, like some uh, European countries, what Turkey has been doing in, in Libya. Mm -hmm. uh, probably they don't want to see another uh, part of uh, MENA region where Russia enjoys a comparable de a degree of, in of influence uh, or hegemony, as uh, Ricardo put, uh, comparable to what it, it currently is enjoying in Syria. 
So Russia, so Turkey is the buffer against Russian entrenchment, basically, even in at the context. Yes, in that particular context, yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, uh, this is a harbinger of a telltale sign of uh, in, an overall improvement in Turkish-American relations. Um, thank you, uh, Zeha. That was uh, really interesting. Actually, uh, also to you, a couple of follow-up questions. So you were talking about Turkish capabilities, um, which are beyond is what's Syria, what what is necessary in Syria. Uh, I'm sorry, in Libya. Um, I wonder. So also based on what the Ricardo described, you know, of these two options, you know, that you know you might have just as basically a, a bargain that uh, divides Libya into in a Turkish and a Russian in a Russian um, plus respective additional patrons um, sphere of influence. So um, I wonder if we assume that um, it will take a while that all the all of Haftar's patrons, including Russia, Egypt, the UAE, um, will be convinced that striking a bargain is the only viable alternative, as opposed to keep on fighting and seeking victory. Um, if we assume that that might take a while, will Turkey be able and willing to keep this up? I mean, I've looked a little bit into, uh, I mean, there's the economic situation. I think there's a very, very particularly low approval of this military operation in the Turkish public. I don't exactly, maybe you have the, right, the, the exact number, but far lower than, for example, the, 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 the last, uh, the, the Idlib operation and other, and other operations in Syria. Yeah. Uh, Turkey has been hit very hard. Uh, I think the, the most um, um, outside of the United States and Europe by the COVID-19 crisis and all of that, as we all know, will also have economic repercussions that will make it, make it more and more difficult to justify military costs. So if, if it's being dragged into for, all, for the two big chunks of reasons that you just mentioned, the economic reasons and sort of broader geopolitical competition uh, reasons in the region, um, um, if for these two reasons, uh, Turkey places its bet on a longer, on a longer military engagement, uh, is the Turkish public be willing to sustain that? What's the domestic response to this? And the capability response, of course. Well, the latest public opinion poll was conducted three months ago, just before my visit to Brussels. And the public support for Turkey's military involvement in Libya was not comparable to the public support to Turkey's military involvement in Syria a number of times. So uh, at this point, at present, I seriously doubt there is even a great, great deal of public awareness on what is going on in Libya. Of course, the social media is vibrant, is active, there is awareness, there is propaganda, etc. But for the wider public, uh, Libya is not an issue. I mean, uh, people are, you know, trying to deal with the fallout from COVID, you know, not only health-wise, but rising unemployment, declining living standards, all that. So Libya is not a priority. Therefore, uh, the public support is, is not there. Uh, uh, it would be, uh, you know, my prediction was, you know, again, back uh, two or three months ago was that it would be an ordeal for Turkey, an ordeal or, or an issue of attrition. It, it's going to be a struggle of attrition, you know, depending on the depth of one's pocket or the extent of resources one can mobilize in support of uh, this cause. But I have to grant that, although, I mean, uh, resource-wise, Turkey, you know, uh, Turkey's options are limited, but it seems that Turkey has been able to use them more productively than, you know, the, the patterns of Haftar, you know. They have been able to achieve a lot with very few. Uh, therefore, uh, at the current level of engagement or commitment to Libya, you know, it's not beyond Turkey's means to stay in Libya or remain engaged militarily in Libya for the foreseeable future. However, uh, for the issue for Turkey is, I guess, uh, the, the number one political objective is, in contrast to Haftar, you know, uh, government of national accord is not seeking a decisive victory and to have a say, uh, control over the whole country. So therefore they're on the defensive. 
which gives them an advantage. Whereas Haftar is on the offensive, and it if and Haftar is pursuing, you know, uh, broader objectives, milit uh, political objectives, which are more, which will require the uh, introduction of larger, greater resources, including military resources. And he doesn't have those such resources, you know, to uproot the, the government in Tripoli. For Turkey, uh, uh, the partition is not a good solution, good option, because then in that case, you lose the legal basis for that uh, memorandum of understanding on the distribution of exclusive economic zone or maritime areas of maritime jurisdiction in the Eastern Mediterranean. Because uh, the legal justification was that, you know, Turkey and uh, Libya, some, uh, some parts of Libya, 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 Libyan coasts, you know, are facing each other. So that gives them a right, a legitimate right to, you know, uh, 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 conclude a, a memorandum of understanding. If Libya is politically and geographically divided into two, so those areas facing Turkish uh, coasts will probably remain in the hands of Haftar forces. And I don't think Turkey will be content with that. You know, I mean, uh, for Tayyip Erdogan, keeping an, a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated uh, actor in power might be as, might be, might might be marketed as a success story, but for other segments of the public and uh, for the step for some other segments of the establishment, you know, uh, giving up on those parts of Libya is not an acceptable uh, uh, choice, I would say. Uh, in contrast to Ricardo, I have to admit that I'm expecting an escalation in the short term, you know, uh, deployment about of 20 some Russian built fighters is an indication of that. And I don't know what is going on, but uh, I won't be surprised if Turkey tries either to uh, rebuild that captured air base uh, uh, into a forward base of operations for Turkish combat aircraft, then uh, we will have the, the infrastructure for escalation. Or alternatively, uh, uh, Ricardo mentioned the case of uh, Algeria. Alternatively, Turkey, I mean, especially President Erdogan may convince Tunisians to allow Turkey to uh, operate out of its <coughs> air bases uh, in the case of an escalation. And that runs the risk of, of course, uh, spreading the conflict to a wider uh, or extending the scope of the conflict to a wider uh, part of the region. But Haftar doesn't have a choice. You know, he has to uh, continue uh, pressing uh, and, and trying uh, deploying more forces, remain on the offensive, and we will see a gradual probably Turkish and Turkish-backed response to that. And in the short term, I think the prospects for an escalation uh, are much higher than, uh, well, uh, are very high. Thank you, Zehat. Um, for those people who have come uh, in the audience, who have come la late, please, in the Q&A function that you see below, uh, keep writing your questions on a running basis. If it's addressed to any of the uh, speakers in particular, just mention that, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, Ricardo, picking up on a few of Zehat's points. So, um, um, on the question of whether an escalation in the short time is um, is likely, um, also Zehar was saying um, um, Haftar is in the offensive, in the GNA in the defensive. Um, would you agree with that assessment? Um, um, what do we know about uh, the military support recently deployed by Russia? Is it in? Is that enough to basically tilt the balance back to Haftar? Um, from what I read, most military uh, analysts. Uh, say that uh, it will not be enough and that basically Haftar's uh, storm on Tripoli or the aspiration to take Tripoli is a lost cause. How would you see that? I would uh, in general agree with that kind of military assessment. The issue obviously of air power, air superiority has always been a decisive one uh, in the Libyan conflict uh, since the very beginning and obviously the uh, the, the, the presence of these Russian fighters is a major, uh, I would say, uh, development in itself. 
But you, when you look at the, the fact that at the same time we are seeing a withdrawal of ground forces from the Tripoli front lines, it's also clear that with these fighters alone and with the presence of uh, anti-air uh, um, uh, anti, uh, um, defense, uh, uh, defense systems uh, in the Tripoli area as well, there's only so much that these fighters can actually realistically achieve. Uh, what it seems more likely is that these uh, fighters are actually there to make sure that if the uh, pro-GNA forces keep pushing south or east, then their ability to actually inflict damages will be limited by the fact that the Russian fighters will then give Haftar's uh, air superiority in these uh, this, uh, this territories. So it's more, they seem to be more uh, geared towards uh, a defensive uh, posture, a defensive strategy, rather than uh, an offensive one, based on what we seem to know and we seem to understand uh, at the moment. So the issue of air superiority, as I'm saying, it's limited when you don't consider the issue of ground forces and anti-air defense systems uh, along the coast and in the in the Tripoli. Okay. Yeah. So does that mean that this deployment would rather indicate that they anticipate an entrenchment of the lines? It could be, it could easily be. So when you, most, most important, I would say, when you compare this, when you pair this with what has been going on politically within Eastern Libya, with rumors that the Russians have been effectively uh, fueling the division, the fight between Haftar on the one hand and Aguila Saleh, the speaker of the uh, Eastern Parliament, that there's basically been this very public spat between the two and the Russians apparently were behind Aguila Sali, encouraging him to break ranks with Haftar and so on and so forth. And Aguila Saleh later basically put forward a sort of potential compromise uh, proposal to the uh, Western, to the Tripoli based institutions. All this would seem to point towards the Russians not being very interested in continuing to support Haftar to the bitter end but rather being interested in consolidating the current uh, military, uh, let's say, front lines, and then work towards potentially, who knows, maybe uh, marginalizing or sidelining or weakening Haftar, and then opening up the, 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 the conversation for some sort of different potential uh, compromise. Okay, we have a lot of questions, um, but just one more question back to you before I, we come to those questions. Um, uh, Ricardo, um, on what Serhat mentioned um, that uh, the United States views uh, Turkey as a sort of buffer against the Russian entrenchment in Libya, uh, would you agree on that? I mean, the recent AFRICOM statement on the Russian deployments was, I guess, uh, unusually strong given that so far in the last, the, 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 the United States has rather taken a backseat. Is it coming back now that it fears Russian entrenchment similar to in Syria? Uh, how do you see the United States position right now? Absolutely, I completely agree with Sahat. Basically, if you look at the past months of US statements and US effectively uh, rumors and indications regarding the US position on, on the Libyan conflict, it's quite clear that the number one priority or concern for the US over the past few months has become the possibility of a Russian takeover, effectively, uh, of Libya. This was the case when they condemned the presence of Wagner mercenaries uh, now a few months uh, ago. This was the case even when, uh, in parallel to the development in Libya, they condemned the possible deal between Egypt and Russia for the sale of uh, a series of uh, Russian um, jet fighters, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to Egypt. Now they're doubling down with the African, the AFRICOM, uh, condemnation of the, 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 the presence of Russian fighters in Libya. And also behind the scenes, the US diplomats have always been, I would say, almost uh, uh, surprisingly clear, surprisingly honest about what was going on, about the fact that Turkey was ready and was openly sending uh, support and troops uh, to Tripoli, etc. They were always very neutral, very uh, happy to see Turkey take over, uh, take this position, and effectively try and contain uh, the Russian expansion, the Russian try attempt to hegemonize Libya. For them, it's a, I would say from, from the American perspective, it's probably a very low cost solution to, or temporary solution to the continuous expansion of Russian 
uh, influence in the region. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jaylan, what, do we have any questions? Yes, we have. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. And the uh, first two questions are about the East Mediterranean. And I, can, I think the uh, first one can be picked by Sarhat Hoca. And this is uh, from the Gaytan Barbe from the International Crisis Group. And he asks, what do, you Tur what do Turkey's gains in Libya essentially mean for the guest disputes with Greece and Cyprus in the Eastern Mediterranean? And the next one is from Kadri Tashtan, GMF. And this is for Ricardo. Uh, to simply say it, Italy seems to be in two different camps at the same time in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the guest dispute against Turkey, but in Libya seems to be closer to Turkish position. How that can evolve, this can evolve in the coming weeks or months, especially the exploration of the gas in the East Med will become much less feasible economically with the pandemic crisis. Okay, Seha, do you want to go first? There was one question addressed to each, I think. Seha, you you muted. Maybe oh, well, I should be able to unmute you, right? Shouldn't I? Uh, the current situation, I guess, where we stand right now, uh, shows that it will not be that easy to dismiss Turkey's claims uh, in the East, Medit maritime claims in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, by others. Uh, uh, I, there was some expectation that Haftar forces would easily overrun uh, the forces of uh, government of national accord and that would spell the end of the deal with Turkey, the deal between Turkey and Libya. This did not happen. And, uh, therefore, it can be considered uh, a gain uh, 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 in favor of Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean. So the deal is there, however contestable, however contested it is, it 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 remains intact. Uh, also, you have the, we have to also take into account that the the sharp decline in oil prices and concomitant decline in the price of uh, natural gas resources probably have turned the region into a less attractive uh, place for investments. Therefore, I see, uh, I expect a gradual uh, decline in, in the tension, in the military tension in the region because the economic stakes are not as high as they seemed, you know, a year ago, six months ago, et cetera. Uh, and therefore, there will be less drilling activity, less uh, exploration activity. And probably we will see, if not a freeze, but a kind of uh, a slowdown uh, in, in, in the activism, military activism uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially on the part of Turkey. Uh, and considering that Turkey and Greece has agreed to jointly you know, sponsor a, a scene to attract tourists into Aegean together, Obviously, I mean, uh, the, t the tension itself around uh, the, the, uh, the, the energy resources in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, is not sustainable under the circumstances. And, and therefore, the deal remains in place after, uh, after uh, uh, Haftar forces were, had to withdraw from uh, the western uh, part of uh, Libya. And they had to, he had to stop his uh, offensive on, on, on Tripoli. Therefore, the deal, you know, uh, remains intact, and this can be uh, this can be considered a gain for Turkey because what Turkey is after is to be brought into the fold of this multilateral framework where the energy issues or the delimitation of exclusive economic zones in the Aegean will be uh, in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean will be discussed. In that regard. That, uh, that was the, the deal with Libya was a cornerstone of the, that Turkish dip, uh, diplomatic negotiation position. It is there. And uh, of particular note is that uh, Israel's reluctance to join, you know, among other signatories uh, to that statement, you know, kind of uh, condemning Turkey for its uh, act activities in and uh, around the Eastern Mediterranean. So, uh, you know, see, it seems that Turkey has, has achieved uh, what it was uh, hoping to achieve with the deal, and it was able to back its policy with military muscle. In that regard, uh, the short answer is, uh, it, it seems that Turkey's political and legal position is stronger than a year ago. 
Okay, perhaps before we go to Ricardo on a different perhaps, do we have any other questions that are related to the East Med gas uh, dispute? Uh, I was just going over the questions, but no, not about okay. the East Med. All right, Ricardo. Yes, so look, the Italian position, uh, which can be defined, I guess, as ambiguous uh, on both the Libyan issue and the East Mediterranean uh, uh, gas uh, story is not really a surprise. Uh, Italy has kept, I would say, a relatively vague and ambiguous position from the beginning, even in the Libyan uh, conflict per se. The uh, linkage between the Libyan conflict and the Eastern Mediterranean uh, dispute that was effectively made after Turkey signed the, uh, the agreement, the maritime delimitation agreement with Tripoli, has obviously created a real dilemma uh, for Italy, because uh, on the one hand, their main concerns on the stabilization of Libya and the, um, the, the, the issue of obviously of migration flows remains priority, uh, remains a real priority for Italy. But at the same time, the presence of ENI in the East Mediterranean uh, is obviously another uh, big concern for Italy, because they're obviously interested in protecting the assets and the presence and the interests of ENI. Uh, in this region, and more generally, they are interested in the development of gas resources that they can they uh, benefit from once they are brought effectively uh, online. If we look at how Italy has actually positioned itself in all of this, it's quite clear that they are very much willing to condemn the maritime delimitation deal of uh, the Turkey sign because they see this and they describe this as a violation of international law, but at the same time, they are refusing to establish a link between the conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean and the conflict in Libya. So if we look at what happened after the deal was signed, Italy participated in the big uh, diplomatic summit with Egypt, France, uh, Cyprus, and all the big basically anti-Turkey uh, powers in the Eastern Mediterranean dispute, but then they refused to sign uh, the uh, very anti-Turkish uh, statement that came out of this. And then they also refused to participate in the following uh, summit that took place uh, a few weeks later where when they uh, officially established the link between what was happening in the Eastern Mediterranean and Libya with Egypt uh, and Greece effectively leading the charge and saying, uh, this is all part of Turkey's expansionist policy in the region and so on and so forth. So, for Italy, the, 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 the need to effectively uh, balance uh, its interest and protect its interest in these two scenarios means that they will continue to maintain this very ambiguous position while reaffirming their refuse to effectively take a very openly anti-Turkish position across the whole region and to link these two issues which Rome wants to consider as separate. Actually, following up on this, Ricardo, we haven't, we barely even mentioned the EU. So um, some analysts say that this situation of sort of threshold of position uh, that we are right now in is a good opportunity to, uh, to relaunch all of the effort of the Berlin process or try to mediate uh, in one way or another, be it by means of the, be, be it through the EU um, or the, the end, but I say both. What do we know? What, do you agree that this is there's a winning opportunity, or do you think this is overstated? Um, what it, what about France and its uh, support to Haftar? Is France ready to, well, not maybe not not drop Haftar, but you know, like to to fall in line with the with with its EU fellows to uh, to subordinate its perhaps its own uh, vested interests to the uh, greater European interests? Do you see any movement on that front? Well, the latest statement by the French is actually an indication that they're very worried about the latest developments and they seem to be particularly afraid of uh, effectively letting Haftar go. Um, they were describing the current situation in Libya as a potential new Syria, which is pretty strong rhetoric uh, considering what, what, has, you know, what has been going on. Uh, the truth is that uh, the EU, uh, after Borrell uh, took over, the position as effectively the foreign minister, if you want to call it that way, uh, of the EU. There was a lot of expectation, a lot of hopes that he would prioritize uh, dealing with the conflict uh, in Libya, and most importantly, would invest quite a lot of resources in making sure that Rome and Paris were aligned uh, on this conflict, which has always been 
the big one of the big problems effectively undermining the effect in the effectiveness of the European uh, of the European position. Now the truth is that this has not been the case, probably because there have been other crises, other priorities that the EU as a as a construction has been really worried with, really uh, preoccupied with. But most importantly, uh, there's been effectively a lack of uh, uh, European uh, influence or a European uh, leadership on this conflict. Now, it's, all, it's very important to look at two parallel developments since we're talking about effectively Italy and France. Italy was not able to preempt effectively a Turkish takeover, if you want to call it that way, of Tripoli, despite the fact that Italy was the closest ally of Tripoli for many years. At the same time, France has been effectively and gradually marginalized and sidelined within the aftercamp to the point where right now it's Russia and the UAE and probably to a lesser extent Egypt that are completely calling the shots. And you know, if you add to this the coronavirus crisis and the economic crisis that has obviously become the number one priority within Europe, the truth is that the Europeans have been completely sidelined they don't have resources and political capital to spend on this conflict and uh, they have left Libya to other powers and they are basically content with making sure that the outcome coming out of all this does not go against their own interests. They're taking a backseat, just making sure that the situation doesn't get out of control. I suspect, this is a pure speculation, but I suspect that if there were one day some sort of Turkish-Russian entente or understanding over Libya, this would not be unacceptable for Italy and France as long as their interests were preserved. Okay, thank you. Let's hear some more questions, right? Thanks for asking about the Berlin process, Christina, because a couple of questions were about the EU involvement and Berlin process. So the next questions, two of the questions are about the US, Russia and Turkey triangle. One of them is from Rachel Elahus and the other one is Jonathan Katz. The first one proceeds as, does Turkey want to be on its own or is there something they expect the US or EU to do help support the GNA, limit Russian advances? The next one from Jonathan Katz, how is Russia's upgrading and bringing in MiG-29 fighters impacting the battlefield? Can you further dissect the Russian and Turkish relations as it relates to Libya? Putin and Erdogan are both weakened politically, politically, economically, and at home. What's the possible end game? Does Turkey need greater U.S. and Western engagement to succeed? Sahat Ojab, could you please pick this up? I have a very short answer uh, to these two combined questions. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, an official statement by NATO General Secretary two weeks ago, I guess, you know, uh, uh, emphasizing the difference between the government of national accord in, Li in Tripoli, which is UN endorsed, and uh, 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 self-styled Field Marshal Haftar. I mean, they were not on comparable legal grounds, basically what that statement was about. This is the kind of uh, support Turkey is need needing. I mean, Turkey would welcome uh, probably U.S. or EU involvement, which would help Turkey consolidate its position in the Libya. But uh, that uh, support uh, should not be, uh, should not reach or should not compromise Turkey's uh, or Ankara's status as uh, the primus inter pares uh, among the supporters of the government of national accord. So as long as they serve Turkey's primacy in the particular context of Libya, they will be welcome. But uh, if they come at the expense of Turkish influence in, uh, in Libya, probably Turkey will be reluctant to welcome uh, support from uh, United States or uh, U European U Union. Uh, as for the introduction of MiG-21 uh, into the theater, I, we don't know how, uh, you know, how, how technologically how superior they are. They might be of older makes, probably Cold War relics, and who will be flying them is another question. Obviously, uh, they are assets that have to be taken into account when considering the situation of forces in Libya. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, I 
tried to, I, several times, I repeatedly emphasized that escalation, the prospects for escalation might, might be really high because this, uh, such an in introduction of such capabilities may invite or may precipitate Turkey's reaction in the form of uh, uh, a more direct involvement of Turkish air power, uh, Turkish combat, manned combat aircraft into in the situation, and and this may result in you know dangerous encounters involving uh, combat aircraft from both sides. Uh, I haven't checked the latest information, but the last time uh, you know I saw a map uh, on their whereabouts on the Russian mix, you know they were uh, they were they were stationed about 1,000 kilometers from uh, Tripoli which is, you know, within the range of those, uh, those aircraft, but still, I mean, uh, they, you know, if they're going to be deployed uh, in those air, air force bases, then their contribution to the operations on the ground or the air superiority over uh, Tripoli will be limited. And in that respect, although uh, the distance between Turkey and Libya is far greater, uh, it, this will make uh, it a lot easier for Turkish Air Force to uh, intercept and to counter that force with the help of tanker aircraft, Turkish aircraft, uh, Turkish Air Force has. Uh, therefore, yes, the, the MiGs are an issue for Turkey uh, uh, and, uh, and probably they will be symbols of escalation of the conflict if they are operationally deployed uh, then they will be they will be symbols of the escalation of the conflict to a new level uh, where turkey uh, turkey's military involvement will go deeper thank you sayat hocam and uh, there is a question uh, there is a question about further involvement of russia in libya and this is from aydın sezer how do we evaluate recent rapprochement between Russia and President of uh, House of Representatives, Mr. Saleh? Is Russia trying to force Haftar to come to the table and it continues uh, as? And if not, is Russia trying to divide Libya? Ricardo, can you please pick this up? Yes, absolutely. So, in you know my uh, conversations with Russian diplomats and also particularly in looking at the latest developments, uh, it's always been clear that the Russians were never enthusiastic about Hafta. Uh, what I heard was that the Russians were very puzzled that despite uh, Hafta's uh, air superiority, thanks to the particularly to the drones that the Emiratis were providing. This is obviously all before Tur Turkey intervened. Uh, despite the presence of you know Emirati drones, despite the presence of Wagner mercenaries, despite the fact that Haftar effectively had all these resources at his disposal, the Russians were very puzzled and they, they, they couldn't really uh, understand how come Haftar had not yet taken Tripoli. The, the, from their perspective this was this should have been a very simple uh, uh, a very simple, uh, I would say, strategy, a very simple solution. Uh, so I'm not really surprised that uh, over the past few weeks we have seen Russia growing increasingly impatient uh, with this current situation and probably supporting, uh, so this, uh, in the spat between Haftar and Aguila Saleh, supporting, as I said before, uh, Aguila Saleh. The impression I'm getting is that effectively the Russians whose primary uh, contacts in the Libyan conflict have always been with the former regime uh, officials and supporters. So Russia has always uh, tried to speak primarily with uh, former supporters of the Gaddafi regime, which are not all and entirely on the, side, uh, on the side with Haftar. This is a completely different constituency uh, that for some time and practically was part of the anti-Tripoli coalition. So I'm not surprised that given all this information, all these points, Russia is effectively now apparently trying to uh, either weaken Haftar and support uh, Gira Saleh, or effectively try to convince Haftar that you know, they could drop him if they wanted to, and therefore that Haftar needs to start listening to what Moscow has to say. Uh, Russia was particularly, uh, I would say, insulted and hurt when Haftar uh, at the Moscow summit refused to accept 
the outcome of the uh, effectively of the Turkish Russian diplomatic initiative back uh, in January. That was a huge uh, offense, a huge insult, effectively after showing everyone, showing the world that Russia was not able to control him. So given all this, and it, it's quite clear that effectively Russians are trying to send a, signal, a message at the very least uh, to Haftar. Now, let's not discount that uh, Libyan actors have always tried to manipulate their own backers. This is a very clear and established pattern since, since the beginning of the conflict. So the fact that Aguila Saleh has been apparently supported by Russia, we should also bear in mind that there's a degree of Aguila Saleh manipulating the Russians against Haftar to save his own position within the, the, the Eastern Libyan uh, political context. So I would lean towards the idea that the Russians are trying to send a message to Haftar that they're trying to make sure that he's in line and he stops effectively misbehaving every time Moscow is trying to tell him what should be done. I'd like just to have just a follow, quick follow-up question on this. So you just said rightfully, uh, Ricardo, how, uh, how Haftar's walkout from the ceasefire negotiations showed that Russia is actually not that influential. It's far from being just a, a, a patriot-client relationship. So uh, maybe we can ask the same question with regard to UAE. So what do we know about uh, how close this relationship is and how, how likely is the UAE to put, put pressure on Haftar? So there's two things here that need, need to be uh, said. The first one is that uh, Haftar in particular has always been very good at uh, playing his backers off each other when he wanted to get out of a commitment he didn't want to commit to. So uh, he could, uh, you know, he, he's done this with the UAE and Egypt, with the UAE, Egypt and France, with the UAE, UAE Egypt and Russia. He's always ready to exploit any divergence there is uh, among his own supporters to make sure that he can continue, he can go on with his own effectively military uh, takeover or, or uh, a hoped for, much hoped for military takeover uh, from his perspective. Now, the interesting element uh, over the past few weeks, even though this, is not, this has not been uh, publicly, but what we have been hearing uh, on the ground is that the Emiratis behind closed doors and not officially are changing the rhetoric, they're shifting the rhetoric, they're now more willing to talk the language of an understanding, the need for a compromise, a certain, if you want, disappointment in uh, Haftar's military capabilities. There seems to be, but again, this is all very speculative at this stage because we don't have a public official confirmation yet, but from what we are hearing, there seems to be an adjustment from the Emirati perspective after the fall of Al-Wutia and uh, the, effectively the military uh, um, debacle of, 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 of Haftar. They seem to be realizing that there's no point in continuing to invest uh, in Haftar till the bitter end, because there is no bitter end uh, in sight. And with Egypt being completely and fully absorbed with his own crisis with Ethiopia and the Nile Dam uh, uh, issue, which is obviously a very long running and very time consuming crisis that combined with the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis internally means that Egypt has very little bandwidth that it can dedicate, it can, that it can use on the Libyan conflict. There seems to be, as I said, the realization that the military solution is not really anymore an option on the table. This could be tactical, obviously. This could be temporary. This could, be, uh, this could change in a few days time. We are used to this in Libya. But it's interesting in itself to say this, to, to point this out. Thank you. And uh, there's a question on the Syrian angle, and this is from Jonathan Katz again. How is Russian and Turkish engagement in Libya impacting cooperation in Syria? Could an escalation in Libya ign ignite challenges in Syria? Could Moscow use Syria to pressure Turkey to back down in Libya? Sarah Tojam, can you please pick this up? Well, that's a very good question, and I don't think I have a satisfactory answer to that. But uh, the Russian-Turkish relations have been characterized by what the analysts call a compartmentalization. So Syria offers an interesting case where, despite their uh, other differences, you know, for pragmatic reasons, Turkey and Russia have been able to reconcile their differences. I mean, uh, their ultimate objectives, I are 
as divergent as you can imagine. You know, Turkey, Ankara is very much interested in seeing, you know, uh, President Bashar Assad leave, whereas the Russian support was to keep in power. So that is a fundamental difference. But despite that fundamental difference, you know, they managed uh, to avoid a confrontation over Syria, and they found pragmatic ways of cooperating. In the case of Libya, uh, in contrast to uh, Syria, Russia is not officially and directly involved. In. So there is always this possibility of plausible denial, which Russians, you know, uh, did a few times in Syria when, you know, reportedly Russian aircraft targeted Turkish troops on the ground, especially during the, the winter campaign of Turkish uh, military. Uh, therefore, uh, Russia has, uh, has an interest in keeping Turkey on its side for a number of strategic issues. Uh, and uh, probably they will not risk those relations or links for the sake of you know, the situation in Libya, uh, uh, unless Russia decides to commit officially and fully to uh, Haftar forces in Libya. Then we will have a direct case involving, you know, Turkey and Russia on two, uh, two sides. And uh, as Ricardo elaborated uh, a few minutes ago, I mean, Russians, you know, they're, uh, uh, they have been dealing on both sides, on various sides of the conflict in Libya. Therefore, uh, a, a direct Turkish-Russian confrontation uh, does not seem possible as things stand, but uh, we may see a dramatic change in the situation in coming days. That's another issue. Actually, I think this is a terrific question. Perhaps uh, this question of if and how Russia and Turkey are going to play out Libya and Syrian arenas against each other. Um, maybe Ricardo, do you want to add anything on this question? I actually completely agree with what uh, Sarhat has said. Uh, the compartmentalization of the Turkish-Russian relations in the Middle East, I would say, has been quite uh, evident from the very beginning, since uh, Turkey started effectively to intervene in the, in the Libyan uh, conflict more directly. Uh, it was clear that, um, and this is what we have managed to pick up, even though it's very difficult to get any clear clarity, uh, regarding the Turkish-Russian relations because they are actually led at the highest level of both states. But the, the impression we had, the, 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 the information we had was that there was no interest whatsoever in linking the two conflicts from, particularly from the Russian perspective and I'm sure from the Turkish perspective as well, the interest is in keeping them separated. These are different, different chips uh, in, in the gener more general bargain, but there is no interest in, make, in uh, uh, linking them openly and, and, and directly. Actually, if anything, the linkage between different issues and different disputes uh, has been coming from the anti-Turkey uh, fronts in the region, uh, as I was mentioning before, Egypt, Greece, and all these countries coalescing and trying to establish an open link between the Eastern Mediterranean dispute uh, and Libya. This, is not, this doesn't seem to be really the interest on the other side uh, and from the Russian perspective either. Thank you, Ricardo. And there's one question from Andre de Monte, and he is asking, could one of the panelists elaborate on the reported presence of Syrian mercenaries on the ground, allegedly sponsored by Turkey or Qatar, and Qatar? And it's open for both of our speakers. There are unconfirmed reports of uh, presence of Syrian fighters uh in libya and also there have been reports of turkish uh airliners and air, uh, um, transport aircraft carrying those fighters to libya and also i mean some of them were reckless enough to share you know uh pictures photos from the battlefield in in, in libya so there is evidence some evidence to suggest that yes those are uh, Syrian fighters were deployed by both sides indeed and I think it was in a, in, in a UN report it was argued that uh, the, the Russians also recruited uh, fighters from Syria uh, uh, for the Libyan conflict but theirs were not as professional or well-trained or experienced as the Syrian fighters Turkey recruited uh, uh, to Libya indeed 
uh, those uh, pro-Assad uh, uh, Syrian fighters complained that they were promised jobs such as, uh, you know, protecting uh, critical infrastructure, uh, military buildings, etc. But they were not told that they would be deployed in the front lines, etc. So uh, it seems that, you know, uh, on both sides of the conflict, there are fighters uh, from uh, brought in from uh, Syria. Would you like to add something, Ricardo? Uh, I mean, I have exactly the same information, even as, as Sarat was saying, effectively, the Russians were trying to uh, do a little bit the same on the other front, uh, right? Supplying effectively these pro-Assad fighters uh, uh, to fight alongside Haftar and Libya, but that doesn't seem to be very successful. The truth is that Haftar continues to rely mostly on uh, uh, African uh, mercenaries plus Russian Wagner's. About Wagner mercenaries uh, for his own uh, um, plans. Thank you. Uh, there is one comment and two remaining questions. I will just ask, uh, read the comment first. It's from Jonathan Katz. On the mix, we have already seen how they are used in Syria. It's possible that they could be used in similar ways. I think it's used as a Russian threat to hang over the head of Turkey and Tripoli. Russia's policies ev everywhere are about creating instabilities and creating zones for potential influence. Haftar is a tool of creating instability. Whether Libya is cut in half, Haftar wins. Libya instability causes problems for West Putin believes he wins. For West Putin believes he wins. Just a comment. And there are two questions and I, these are both for you, Sarat Hocam. One of them is from Barton Yunaj. Is Turkey testing newly manufactured weapons in Libya? Will this new capacity push Turkey to prioritize use of force in foreign policy? And the second one is from Alan Makovsky. Any insight into reason for removal of Admiral Yaiji, arguably the father of the Mavi Vatan concept, and the Libya intervention? Will his departure affect ongoing Libyan operations in any way? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Barchin Yunan's... Uh question uh well uh i think it was two years ago two summers ago or in the summer of 2019 or 18 i guess uh when we read the reports of a chinese built uoa operated by hafter forces shut down by a lay ground laser weapon developed by and deployed by turkey in libya so uh that indeed was for me the first indication of Turkey's determination to do whatever it can do to keep uh, the, the, the government of uh, uh, national accord intact in Libya because those are new systems, very high-tech systems and we at that, until that point we did not know they, they were, they could be operationally deployed. So Therefore, I'm going to back one or uh, back to my uh, the opening remarks, you know, uh, Libya has also become a proving or confirmation ground for Turkey's uh, local uh, nationally built weapons systems. Uh, could this prompt more militarization of Turkish foreign policy? Well, yes and no, it depends on the objectives one pursues. Uh, Libya is a relatively small scale area of operations and it, you know, uh, the environment is conducive for deploying and uh, testing new weapon systems uh, and with some, in some cases with spectacular results, etc. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, Turkey has been arguing that dependence on a foreign supplier of military hardware limits its freedom of action in foreign policy. In other words, its ability to back its diplomacy with military muscle. So uh, as that dependency decreases, I mean, we can assume or we can deduct from the past complaints that Turkey feel uh, less constrained, but outside by, by outside actors to uh, uh, add military muscle to its foreign policy activism. Yes, therefore, uh, it is possible to see uh, a greater reliance on military means in Turkish foreign policy. 
But on the other hand, I mean, well, you may develop and, uh, and build uh, weapons locally, nationally, still, you know, uh, resource is a problem. You know, this butter and gun dilemma is, uh, uh, remains uh, valid, whether you import guns or you produce them at home. So uh, Turkey is going through an economic crisis and its ability to support a militarized foreign policy is diminishing as we speak. Therefore, there is this potential but the realities on the ground show otherwise. And as for Alan Makovsky, I have an issue with uh, J Jihad Yaiju being the father of the concept of Mavi Matan. No, uh, the, the concept, indeed it's an umbrella uh, concept. Let me uh, begin with this, uh, the Mavi Matan or the Blue Homeland uh, concept uh, is an umbrella concept because you know, Turkey has been trying to tackle with a number of maritime jurisdiction issues, you know, the territorial waters, continental shelf, exclusive economic zone. And it is difficult to convey your message to the Turkish public to draw support for, you know, with such a terminology, with such a, such a vernacular. So uh, this umbrella concept was introduced to raise public awareness on the maritime jurisdiction issues. Uh, but the concept, I think, uh, has been largely misunderstood as claims of sovereignty, you know, uh, that, that I have to grant. The concept of Mavi Vatan, Blue Homeland, was coined by uh, retired Admiral Cem Gürdeniz back in the 1990s or in the early 2000s. And he was purged in 2011 from the ranks of Navy uh, as a result of this uh, court uh, cases on uh, fabricated uh, documents. And indeed, two years ago, Turkish Navy conducted a, an exercise named Mavi Vatan, Blue Homeland. So the concept is a, a concept that was developed by the Turkish Navy to, uh, uh, to raise the public awareness on the issue. Uh, the problem with Jihad Yaiji, he was the most ardent advocate of idea of concluding a maritime uh, jurisdiction delimitation deal with Libya as well as Israel. You know, his thinking, uh, his line of reasoning is equally applicable to uh, Turkey and Israel as well. So he had been the champion of the idea. Uh, however, uh, I think uh, uh, he went too far with his pursuit of publicity uh, in, in Turkey and that cost him his uh, position. Uh, his, uh, his pursuit of publicity uh, uh, did not correspond what, uh, as an admiral, as a flag officer, what he could deliver. And, uh, and therefore, uh, I think Navy remains committed to the concept or for some to the doctrine of Mavi Vatan, Blue Homeland, regardless of who is, you know, who is in the ranks, who, who, is, who is not. And some tend to argue that this was an indication that, you know, Turkey may uh, uh, adopt a, a lower profile as regards to its assertiveness in the Eastern Mediterranean, etc. Uh, but I, I'm, I don't agree uh, with uh, this kind of an uh, interpretation, I would say. I think uh, he was a jihad IJ. He had qualifications. He had a, a, a PhD. He has a PhD. He's smart. He, he can be considered the mastermind behind the deal, uh, the, the Libya-Turkey deal, etc. Uh, but we, we should not be identifying such an umbrella concept, such a comprehensive concept with a single individual. Thank you, Sayat Ajam. Christina, do we have uh, time for just one final question? And there's also one yeah, comment. There's, there's two parts. There are questions. Let's see if, I think there's one more question, right? And, yes, uh, exactly. There's one comment from Haldun Solmastrik, and he says yeah. presence of Syrian militia under Turkish control has already been confirmed by yeah. President Erdogan himself. So the comments are basically related, I think, to just basically making clear, uh, you know, that uh, Wagner is controlled by Russia and, you know, and who, who is the actual behind that, that we shouldn't let ourselves be fooled by, uh, um, by plausible deniability, but it's more of a comment. So I think we have one more question that's actually uh, requiring uh, an, an answer, is that right, um, for 
which which one is that? Uh, this one is again on Hafter's uh, support structure, and this is from Benjamin Priestler, uh, and this is for Ricardo. Regardless of the international actors, how solid is Hafter's support structure now? How happy would Misrata and others be to deal a deal now? That's a really, a really good question, and I would say a very central uh, question as well. Um, there would seem to be a, uh, I would say, a weakening of uh, support for Hafta within his traditional constituencies and specifically tribal uh, groups supporting him in Eastern Libya, particularly the tribal groupings uh, that are traditionally affiliated with uh, Aguila Saleh, which obviously, you know, this is not just a personal spat between two leaders, but it also mirrors an equal, uh, I would say, division within uh, uh, at least Eastern Libyan society. So that's obviously significant, potentially, if this spat becomes something more serious. And for example, if Haftar tries to impose military rule in Eastern Libya, as he threatened to do, the, to do uh, only a few weeks ago, this could lead to some more serious splits and some more serious tensions uh, um, within Eastern Libya. Now, the question about uh, whether Ms. Rata and uh, were, you know, the main Western Libyan uh, groups and constituencies are ready to uh, make a deal with Haftar, I think is a very uh, serious uh, and, and uh, worth discussing uh, question because the signals and the messages that are coming out of Western Libya right now are definitely not messages of peace, messages of compromise. Uh, the rhetoric coming out of Western Libya is pretty much a rhetoric of let's go on, let's continue until we defeat Haftar, we liberate the, particularly the oil uh, infrastructure that is being currently uh, uh, shut in by Haftar forces. So this is as now in the rhetoric at least is one of the main military priorities for Western Libyan groups. Uh, because obviously the the uh, um, let's say the closure of these ports means that right now no oil revenues are accruing to the to the Libyan central bank, which is causing also another type of conflict, which is a financial conflict conflict within Libya. So there is no rhetoric or no indication whatsoever that the West, Western Libya, uh, Western Libyan militias and groups are ready for a compromise. This is why uh, a Turkish a potential, a possible Turkish Russian understanding would also require a significant degree of pressure on their respective proxies within Libya. As we discussed already, Russia is already doing this to an extent, but it's unclear whether the Emirates and Egypt are fully on side with this. The Turks will have, would have to do this if this happens, if this understanding takes uh, shape. Uh, but then there is the big question that we've only really quickly touched upon of whether Algeria is actually preparing to strike a military pact with uh, uh, the government of national accord. There are significant interesting rumors pointing in this direction, which would obviously further complicate the picture, even though Algeria is unlikely to be a spoiler of any sort of deal, because what the, their main interest is the stabilization uh, of Libya and obviously keeping in check foreign influences in Northern Africa. But it's in itself an additional layer of complexity to a conflict that uh, in the next few weeks, I would say, will go through a very uh, peculiar and delicate, uh, I would say, passage uh, in its development. Uh, thank you both. We're nearing the end. Actually, picking up on your last sentence, before we close, um, perhaps to both of you, from the top of your head, can you give me one sentence? Where do we stand in a month? Sehad. Mm, that depends on uh, how, uh, when, or if those Russian uh, MiGs are deployed offensively against the forces of, against the Turkish interests and Turkish forces directly, and uh, the forces of uh, government of national accord. Uh, if in a couple of weeks' time uh, we see that they are operationally deployed, against Turkish interest, then uh, we, will, we will probably discussing a far more serious conflict situation involving uh, inviting not only Turkey and Russia, but uh, even United States uh, and Algeria, as Ricardo put it earlier a few times. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, 
I would say my gut feeling uh, would push me towards some possible overture, diplomatic overture. That's where we might be uh, in a month's time, some possible attempt at least at reaching some understanding. Uh, I think this is something that could happen, but with the big caveat that the possibility of a military escalation, escalation should not be discounted just yet. Okay, with that, on that happy note, thank you both very much. Thank you, Teja Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Jaylan. Everybody who tuned in, thank you very much and uh, have a nice day, afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye.